Welcome everyone to the Brexit Readiness Video Guide on Erasmus Plus, organised by University UK International. This video guide is aimed at everyone working in European higher education, specifically on Erasmus Plus, um, and will treat mobility, strategic partnerships, or the joint master's degree part of the programme in this guide today. Um, today we're going to aim to provide you with the most up-to-date information in order to help you with your no-deal Brexit preparedness and need to make the final additions to any further measures you might need to put in place in the run-up to the 31st of October or any future no deal dates. So this video will be in three segments and all of this information may not be relevant to you but you can skip to the relevant policy area by clicking in the chapters in the video description below. My email address I will also include on the final slide. Please feel free to drop me a question or a comment if you've got any further need for clarification. We also have a dedicated no deal advice section on the University UK website, which I'll include links in the comment description below as well. So I'm Nabil Ali, I'm Policy Officer for Europe and I lead on European Higher Education at University UK International, uh, specifically for Erasmus+. Plus. So in terms of the content for this presentation, firstly, I'll be recapping on the latest policy announcements related to Firstly, the European Commission's regulation on Erasmus Plus, and secondly, the UK government's underwrite for Erasmus Plus. Then I'll talk about what that means in practice, the key action one, mobility of staff and students, key action two, strategic partnerships, capacity building, etc. etc. And I'll go on very briefly to talk about the universities, uh, European Universities Initiative, the Jean Monnet project, and the Mondo Stock Masters degrees. In part two then, I'll talk very quickly about how the Government Cabinet Office portal will work in practice, how you can register, and in the final part I will talk, um, I will answer some frequently asked questions that have been submitted to University UK International uh, in, over the past few weeks then. So as mentioned before, all of this information may not be relevant to you, but be, uh, please feel free to skip to the relevant policy area by clicking on the chapters below. Okay. So what will happen to the UK's participation in Erasmus Plus in a no-deal Brexit? So firstly, I'll just say that if a deal is reached with the EU, then the transition period for that deal will last until the end of 2020, uh, which is the end of the Erasmus Plus programme seven-year cycle. So if we do get a deal then, the UK participation in Erasmus Plus is secured until the end of 2020. In a no-deal, as you can imagine, it becomes slightly more complicated. So there are effectively two guarantees in place for funding to continue. The first one is the European Contingency Guarantee on Mobility. The Commission ratified a regulation earlier this year on what it called the continuation of provisions for the mobility um, under Erasmus Plus in case of a no-deal exit. What that essentially means is that any key action one participants, including Erasmus Mundus, which I will go on to talk about a bit later, who are abroad at the time of exit, so actually on the placement, on the ground, when the no-deal Brexit happens, they will be able to complete their placement without having their funding interrupted. So this applies to both UK and EU students or staff outbound from or inbound to the UK. So as I just previously mentioned, it's all gone through the European Council and will come into effect um, if the UK leaves without a deal on the 31st of October or any future no-deal date. The Commission have published FAQs on this regulation, which are really helpful, and I encourage you to have a look at those also, and I will include a link in the comments description below. Okay, and just to note very quickly that this only covers Key Action 1 mobilities and will not apply to any Key Action 2 or Key Action 3 or any other part of the programme um, on Erasmus+. Plus. In terms of contingency measures for these parts of the programme, if the only uh, offer on the table from the EU side is that if the UK pays into the EU budget for 2019 and 2020, the UK will have full access to the programme, will be able to participate in uh, the Key Action 2 and Key Action 3 programmes to the full fruition and full length of their natural projects. Okay, so that's really quickly the EU contingency regulation for Erasmus Plus. So the second guarantee then is the UK government underwrites for Erasmus Plus. So this is independent from the EU contingency regulation. So what this means then is if the mobilities which begin after the 31st of October, so aren't in flight and therefore aren't covered by the EU contingency regulation, the UK government will underwrite viable Erasmus Plus projects which was signed and ratified by the Commission and the UK National Agency prior to the date of Brexit. 
So this effectively means that outbound mobilities will be underwritten where funding has been received through previous calls, so your 2018 and your 2019 calls. The underwrite policy, uh, the guarantee states that the underwrite will not cover funding committed to projects and partners in other member states and other participating countries. So this is mainly uh, a caveat for key action two projects. And just to mention as well, the UK government underwrite will only cover outbound student mobility. EU universities will not be able to use their Erasmus funds to send students to the UK and will have to do so uh, by other means. Okay, so what does this mean in practice then for Key Action 1 projects? So the good news is Key Action 1 projects are largely covered. So Key Action 1 projects which are currently in progress with students currently um, planned to go out, they'll be able to continue their mobilities as normal through the UK government underwrite. So for Key Action 107 mobilities, which is the international credit mobility, and for Key Action 105, the youth mobilities. Although the notice and the, uh, the wording in the technical notice says that project committed to funding uh, EU partners abroad will not be covered, the exception for this is actually 107 and 105. So in these key actions and these key actions only, incoming and outgoing students will be funded. Okay, and just to note as well, it will be not be possible to submit any Erasmus Plus projects um, for, uh, for uh, to submit under the application for assessment under the 2020 call because, as you know, in a no deal, we'll be no longer be a partner country and therefore we'll not be able to participate in the mobility aspects of the Erasmus Plus programme. So I'll just give you an example then. So I've said, be mindful of students on multiple mobilities. So I'm just going to give you an example of a student that's studying French and German who's gone abroad um, on the 30th of October 2019. So as they went abroad before the 31st of October, which is the current no deal date, their Erasmus fund, uh, Plus funding is covered completely by the European uh, Contingency Regulation. However, they have to undergo a second placement um, halfway through the year. This second placement is not covered by the EU contingency regulation, but would be covered by the UK government's um, underwrite guarantee. Okay. So that was key action one. What does this mean for key action two? Uh, so unfortunately, the situation here is a bit more complicated, but I will try to go through it uh, very quickly and very comprehensively at the same time. So I'll mainly be talking here about the three actions on Key Action 2, which are strategic partnerships, capacity building for higher education, and knowledge alliances. Uh, to my knowledge, the rules for knowledge alliances uh, are also the same for the sector skills alliances for the VET sector, but please do consult the Erasmus programme guide to double check this. So for strategic partnerships then, if the UK leaves the union without a deal in place, the UK will revert to partner country status. Um, so what does this mean? So it's not actually permitted for strategic partnerships to be led by partner countries. Um, and it's also the case for strategic partnerships that it's not possible for the UK to transfer the lead onto another country. Therefore, the overall project would not be deemed viable and therefore the UK government underwrite would not apply and they would fund any part of the project. The only aspect where the UK government underwrite would be able to continue to fund this, if you can come to an agreement with your universities uh, your partner universities to self-fund their participation in the project and uh, create a bilateral or a multilateral partnership that would be able to achieve the same goals and aims of the initial Erasmus Plus project. If you can prove this, then the UK government will fund the UK side. But as I mentioned previously, the EU side would have to be funded by the EU university, uh, EU, EU universities themselves outside of the Erasmus Plus funding on offer to them. So that mainly covers strategic partnerships with UK organisations as leads or UK organisations as partners then in projects. So UK, um, so projects that are being led by EU partners. Existing projects with the UK as a partner will still receive funding through their lead KA2 partner. Um, and in order for projects to continue, a restructure may be required. And the eligibility requirements according to the Erasmus Plus programme guide is that there needs to be three institutions based in three programme countries in the consortium. 
And so this may need, um, this may require adding an additional partner, uh, one based in the programme country other than the UK. Just to note as well, that these consortiums with UK as partners, not leads, it may be possible for the UK to uh, revert to being a non-funded or non-affiliated associative partner. These are partners where they, they do technically exist in the consortium, but they do not receive any funding through Erasmus Plus. They're just merely there to add uh, expertise um, to enable the project to continue um, and to establish its initial um, goals at the end of the project. If the UK partner does revert to become a non-funded associated partner, technically through the rules of the government underwrites on the website, it seems like you, the UK government would fund that aspect of it. However, it's unclear at this point um, whether it actually would in practice and we've yet to receive clarification on this. Okay, so that was strategic partnerships. I'm going to just run through knowledge alliances and capacity building projects also. These are mainly the same as the strategic partnerships. However, the key difference is that for UK leading these projects, it is possible to transfer a lead on these projects to another partner if this is necessary for those projects to continue. Excuse me. The capacity, uh, sorry, the knowledge alliances, these projects will only be deemed viable if there are a minimum of six independent organisations from at least three programme countries, out of which there need to be two higher education institutions and two enterprises. For capacity building projects, um, there need to have be two programme countries remaining in the consortium, obviously not including the UK, for it to be continued, uh, for it to be considered to be um, continued to be viable. Again, in order to um, meet these eligibility applications uh, requirements, sorry, you may have to add another partner or take another partner away or restructure the, the consortium in a way um, that means that it can continue in its current fashion. Again, as I said, for the strategic partnerships, it may be possible for the UK to become a non-funded uh, associated partner or affiliated partner in both knowledge alliances and capacity building projects in the way I've described with strategic partnerships with the UK government on right just applying to cover that bit of the non-funded um, aspect that the UK would have received otherwise as a full partner, but it's not clear yet if this is within the scope of the government on right and if the government on right will include this. Okay, I'll just now go on to talk about the European Universities Initiative. So this is actually a key action to pilot initiatives. So actually the European Contingency Regulation, as it only applies to key action one, it will not apply to this initiative. So any 2009 first and second, uh, first and second call applications with the UK as the lead coordinator in this initiative will be assessed and processed normally while the UK remains in the EU member states. In a no deal, however, UK participation in the and the initiative will not be able to continue. So if you have a project with the UK lead, it's being assessed and during the assessment process, the UK leads without a deal, that, process, that project will immediately become unviable. So it's not recommended that you continue or submit an application with the UK as a lead. Okay, so if you are a lead in a, or you are considering becoming a lead, it's advised for you not to have a consortium with fewer than three programme countries independent of the UK. And in consortia with more than three programme countries, you're advised to pass the lead on to another uh, non-UK university. So as mentioned, it's not advised for you to lead um, one of these consortia if you're a UK university. At the moment, it's currently uncertain whether UK universities will be able to become non-funded associated partners or affiliated. Right, will work in terms of logistics for covering participation where UK universities are partnered in a already established UK uh, EU universities initiative. Initiative. However, initial conversations with the, with the Department of Education have been very positive, but we yet to know how this will work in practice. Okay, I'm now just going to move on very quickly to talk about Erasmus Mundus joint master's degrees. 
Again, this is quite complex, but I'll try to summarise it very quickly and very succinctly. So the EU Commission, uh, the European Commission contingency regulation does actually apply to Erasmus Mundus degrees and scholarship holders. So this mainly applies to scholarship holders who commence their programmes and are receipt of their Mundus scholarships prior to the date of exit. And this regulation will mean they will be able to complete their full programmes in their entirety. So this includes any planned future study in the UK as usual. Uh, sorry, this includes any plans, planned study or any future study in the UK as usual. So basically, Mundus scholarships you've started before the date of exit can continue as normal. So I've listed there on the slide just the three situations where this would apply to. So also, for the contingency regulation, any consortium with a UK partner or lead will continue to be classed as a programme country just in Erasmus Mundus scholarship programmes for the sole purpose of enabling the Erasmus Mundus scholarship holders who have started their programme prior to the UK's withdrawal uh, from the EU to complete their programme. And, and this will apply until the completion of the last intake started before the date of a no deal Brexit. So as soon as you've had all your students complete their degrees who started before the date of exit, you then revert to partner country status. But before that point, you're a program country status, even if we are in no deal. So what, does, what then happens to programmes with students starting after the date of exit? So just very briefly, it's likely there'll be a grace period between the final intake of students who commence their courses before exit date finishing and the first cohort of students who commence their program after the date of exit. In order for you to adjust your consortium to meet Erasmus Mundus eligibility requirements, in order for you to continue on your current contract, to continue your degree or to establish a new contract, so you will be given the option. At this point, I'm not sure how long the grace period will be and it's advised for you to adjust and to um, recompose your consortium to make sure it meets the requirements as soon as possible. And there is further information on this on the Erasmus FAQs, which is linked in the comments um, box below. Okay, so I'll just very briefly talk about some lesser known aspects of the programme, but nevertheless important. So welcome to do Jean Monnet projects. So as you know, Jean Monnet projects are aimed at promoting excellence in teaching and research in European studies worldwide. These activities are not actually restricted to European member states or Erasmus Plus programme countries. There will, therefore, there will be no change to existing Jean Monnet projects and UK institutions will be able to bid for future Jean Monnet lots of funding and after future course open. So good news for Jean Monnet. What happens to Erasmus um, plus master's loans? So the commission has confirmed that the master's loans uh, agreements that were signed before withdrawal date will receive the full benefits of the EU financial loan terms and conditions. Uh, independently of any other Erasmus plus contingency regulations. However, loans contracted after withdrawal date will not be eligible for the EU financial terms and conditions, regardless of any other contingency measures that are in place. Okay, so that was part one, discussing the policy updates and how they apply to your programmes, whether that's Key Action 1, Key Action 2, Jean Monnet, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in part two, I'm going to discuss registering projects on the UK government portal. Uh, and please note that uh, the Department of Education have actually recorded very recently a video guide on how to register projects. I encourage you to view that if you have any other further queries or wish to clarify any bits of information. I'll include a link to that in the description box below. So, I'll go through this very quickly then. So the government's grant management function will be the mechanism through which institutions will be able to claim for the Erasmus Plus underwrite funding. The Department for Education have clarified there's currently no deadline for institutions to register projects on the portal. But only successful projects are currently eligible to be added. So that's projects where you've been notified you've been successful or you've had a grant agreement issued to you. So the first step in this process is for you to register your project. Um, so just note this is for registering, not claiming. These are two very different processes. 
So to, to register your uh, project, you would go on the grants management function. And again, I'll include a link to that in the comments box below. You go on the uh, EU grants registration spreadsheet. You'll open that and fill in that um, with the information. It's simple information about the contact, uh, your partner, uh, sorry, your project name, uh, your institution name and address, etc., etc. So there is a dedicated email address as well. That's helpdesk.grants.registration@cabinetoffice.gov.uk. That's um, available Monday to Friday. Um, if you've got any questions, please do email them, and then normally get back to you between three to five working days. I'm going to have to pause, I'm afraid. Why? Because something's come up on your desktop. Oh, is that, is that? So, for moving on to Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's Degrees, this situation there is quite complex but largely positive. So, as I mentioned before, the European Commission's regulation for Erasmus Plus contingency does apply to Erasmus Mundus. So they basically said that any Erasmus Mundus scholarship holders who commence their programmes on our receipt of their scholarships prior to the date of exit will be able to complete their full programmes, including any planned or future study in the UK, as usual. So this will include students in the following categories, as is on the slide. So any consortium with a UK partner or lead will continue to actually be classed as a programme country. Um, as long as there are students in that consortium who started their programmes before the date of exit. And they will be classed as a programme country for the sole purpose of enabling those scholarship holders to complete their programmes in full. So that essentially means that until the last, until the completion of the last intake you started before the date of exit completes, you're a programme country and then after that you're a partner country. So for students um, and programmes starting their courses after the date of exit, it's likely there'll be a grace period between the final intake of students who commence their uh, courses before exit date finishing and the first cohort of students who commence their programmes after the date of exit. Um, and it will be a short grace period for consortia to adjust their uh, programmes if they want to con continue on their current contract or to start a new programme on a new contract with a new set um, of universities on a new programme. Um, so please do see the Erasmus FAQs for further information on this. Okay, so I'll just go on to talk very quickly about other aspects of Erasmus Plus, which are lesser known, but nevertheless important. So first of all, Jean Monnet. What happens to Jean Monnet projects in an ideal? So, John Monet activities, uh, as you know, are aimed at promoting excellence in teaching and research in European studies and worldwide. So therefore, these activities are not restricted to European member states or Erasmus Plus programme countries, and there will therefore be no change to existing Jean Monnet projects, and UK institutions will be able to bid for future Jean Monnet funding as the future course open. For Erasmus Plus Master's Loans, the Commission has confirmed that Master's Loans their agreements that are signed before withdrawal date will receive the full benefits of the EU financial loan terms and conditions. And this is independent of any Erasmus plus contingency regulation. Um, but loans contracted after withdrawal date will not be eligible for the EU financial terms and conditions um, as well. Okay, so that was the first section covering the policy updates for the EU contingency regulation, the UK government underwrites guarantee, and how that applies to Key Action 1, Key Action 2, European universities, Erasmus Plus Mundus um, degrees, and Jean Monnet and Masters Lane. So now I'm just going to talk very quickly about how to register projects on the UK government portal and some uh, information, further information regarding this. So the UK government portal, uh, the grants management function will be the initial platform for registering projects. Um, and there's two stages to this. The first stage is registering and the second claim, sorry, the second stage is claiming. So the first stage for registering, I advise you to do as soon as possible. And the Department of Education have clarified that there's currently no deadline for institutions to register projects on the portal. 
for any successful projects are currently eligible to be added. So that's project you've been notified have been successful or you've received a grant screening for. You can register up to five grants at once and if you've got more to register, then there you go on the, um, you can email the uh, email address that's provided. So the registration is fairly straightforward. It's fairly straightforward information, including your institution address, your project names, et cetera, et cetera. So the second part then is if the UK leaves without a deal on the 31st of October or any point following, your institution will receive an email from the Department of Education providing a link, an invitation code to access the government underwrite where claims for the government underwrite can be submitted. And this essentially is an activation of this system. So the main thing here is that in order to be able to claim for the government underwrite, as well as the various technical information I've included on the slide, what you'll need is to complete the confirmation of continuation form provided on the dfb.gov.uk page. So DFB has stated they require a form of written evidence to show that Erasmus Plus projects will continue to be viable and therefore eligible for the UK government underwrite. So what this means in practice is that you will need written confirmation from projects, uh, sorry, from partners, including work placement partners, to say that they're happy to take your students even in the context of a no deal. Now, this just needs to be a written confirmation in the form of an email or a letter. It doesn't have to be in the form of a formal bilateral agreement. Once you've received this, you would list your projects, your partners uh, who have confirmed that are happy to take your students in the event of a no deal with your grant agreement numbers on the confirmation of continuation form. And you'd send this off to your head of organisation or your vice chancellor to sign who asserts that these projects can therefore continue in the event of a no deal. So just then to be crystal clear, you, your institution will not be required to upload bilateral in, inter-institutional agreements for every partner in order to make a claim, but you will be required to keep any written assurances you've received which assert partnerships can continue outside of Erasmus Plus. At some point in the future, and I imagine you to do this as soon as possible, you will need a formal bilateral agreement in place as a legal basis for you to conduct the mobility agreement under, but this isn't a legal requirement for accessing the government underwrite. This is just for your future relationship with your partners because there has to be some sort of bilateral agreement outside of the Erasmus Plus interinstitutional agreement of which that mobility happens. Um, at present, the Department for Education has stated that learning agreements or grant agreements, even if they're dated and signed by partners and students before mobility departure and will show that the mobility will go ahead, this will not count as evidence that partnerships will be able to continue as these documents relate to mobility occurring inside the Erasmus Plus programme. And what's needed is confirmation that mobilities and uh, uh, study abroad placements can continue outside of the Erasmus Plus program. So I mentioned work placement very briefly, but universities will be required to confirm with each employer that they will be able to take students in the event of a no deal, and this will be difficult on many levels. And for many of you, it will be a big task to contact um, a large amount of employers to get this information. If you cannot get written assurance from each individual work placement provider at this time or directly before making a claim, it will not make the overall key action one project unviable. It will mean that the government underwrite will not underwrite the funding for this particular work placement provider only. So we, we advise uh, universities to make note of these students who may return from their Erasmus Plus um, placement early and we continue to advise in this, sorry, the Department of Education said that learning agreements or grant agreements, even if dated and signed before mobility departure, and will show the mobility will take place, is not sufficient as evidence, as these documents relate to mobility occurring inside the Erasmus Plus programme. If you have a separate institutional um, contract that you use that does not reference Erasmus Plus, it's unclear at this point whether that will count as evidence. 
But generally what's needed is a written assurance from uh, that partnerships can continue outside the Erasmus Plus framework in the event of a no deal. So this is fairly straightforward for study placements, but for work placements, um, universities will be required to confirm with each employer that they are able to take students in a no deal. And this, as you can imagine, will be difficult on many levels, particularly some universities have a large amount of employers and some individual employers, particularly smaller ones, will feel quite uncertain as to what the situation is with regard to Brexit. So here I advise if you cannot get the written assurance you need from workplace providers at this time or directly before making a claim, it will not make your overall Key Action 1 project unviable. It will just mean that the government underwrite will not underwrite the funding for that specific work placement provider only. So in a situation where students are only confirmed, their employers are only confirmed slightly before um, they go out for mobility, um, that's fine. You just put in a claim at a later date um, using the regular uh, confirmation of continuation form, and then you can list that employer on that form once you've confirmed it, um, and that will be processed in the normal way and will be underwritten by the UK government underwrites. Just to mention as well, importantly, for an no deal and for work placements, students will be able to stay in their EU destination country for a total of three months, after which they will be able to, they will be subject to each individual member state's rules on residency and study. So please do visit each um, EU27 uh, embassy website for further information. For work placements specifically, um, and this includes unpaid or paid Erasmus Plus work placements, There'll be separate rules on visa and immigration requirements, and it's encouraged for you to check your legal teams as to the status of these. So basically, students on work placements can stay for three months. That's fine. If they want to work on an unpaid work placement beyond this, it's unclear depending on what which EU member state you're in, what visas uh, you'll need, or what immigration requirements you'll have to fulfil to be able to continue that placement. Now, we imagine that all students, because of visa regulations, may not be able to continue their placements as they would have normally done. Um, so we advise universities to take note of those students who may be at risk and those students who will, may return um, home from their Erasmus Plus work placement early. And we encourage universities to advise and to, in this, if the students in this situation as far as possible if students can switch to study placements, um, if possible, or can complete a placement in the UK. It's unconfirmed as of yet, but it may be the case that the rules of force majeure may carry over in the event of a no deal. Um, so in the case of a work placement, force majeure would apply if a student has done under 60 days on a work placement. Okay, so the final part then of this uh, video guide is just some commonly frequently asked questions that have come to University of UK International over the last few weeks. Um, these are by no means exhaustive and please do email me further questions or comments if you've got um, further queries related to any aspect of this video guide I've discussed or any aspect that I've not discussed that's within the Erasmus Plus programme. So, first question is, uh, will organisational support be covered by the UK government underwrite? Um, so, as I'm sure you all know, organisational support is very important for the running of these programmes within each institution. So, the Department of Education has said that they want to mirror processes as far as possible um, in line with what was already existing for the Erasmus Plus programme, and this in theory should cover organisational support. However, we don't have any further written assurances on the DfE's um, page or on the national agency's FAQs written by DfE that organisational support will be covered. Um, so that's a TBC at this moment in time. Question two then, uh, what will happen, uh, sorry, what will be required for audit purposes if claiming on the UK government underwrite guarantee? Again, it's pretty much the same answer as before. You, the Department for Education has said they want to mirror the Erasmus Plus processes as far as possible, uh, but actually what that looks like in practice, we're not yet sure. So it may be the case that existing monitoring, reporting and audit requirements will be the same as were for the National Agency and the Commission, but we're yet to know um, from the Department of Education what any additional measures would need, uh, would need to be in place. 
So what will happen to student finance entitlements for students on Erasmus Plus um, on the underwrite and also the top up that universities get. So just for example, using the example of England, there's a high rate um, of maintenance loan given to a university students on an Erasmus Plus place, uh, placement. Also for uh, their eligible for travel grants and universities uh, given a top up of the maximum tuition fee by the OFS and students only pay a specific amount of the tuition fee um, the year that they're abroad. Um, again, this is yet to be confirmed uh, and this is something that we're told that the Department of Education are aware of and will be updating in due course on their website. And finally then, what is in place to cover mobility funding for 2020 and beyond? At present, there's nothing confirmed to replace Erasmus Plus or Mobility for 2020 call onwards, uh, but uh, previous indications from the Universities Minister and the Education Minister have said that they want to create uh, the considering continued participation in Erasmus and if it's not possible, looking into a future domestic replacement scheme. So that concludes the Erasmus Plus video guide um, and hopefully you found this useful. If you, again, as I've mentioned, if you do have any questions or comments, please do email me. My email address is on the slide below uh, or please do comment on the YouTube video. Um, I've just signposted you to a few really key resources that I do think you should view as part of a follow-up to watching this video. The first one is the University UK International No Deal Briefing Guide, which covers Erasmus Plus, but also covers other European funding programmes such as Horizon 2020, and also covers aspects such as student fees and immigration requirements. There is also the University UK International Erasmus FAQs and Guidance page, which is a helpful summary of everything that's discussed on this webinar today, uh, but goes into further detail. As mentioned previously, the European Commission has published FAQs on their contingency regulation and I, re I really recommend you having a look at that because it goes into a lot of detail and very simple and straightforward to understand. The Department for Education also have their FAQs on the National Agency website on their Brexit update page, which goes into further detail on how the UK government on the right will apply um, and also has some specific links to other questions such as immigration and healthcare arrangements and some good signposting to resources on there. And finally, the Department of Education have also put, a, uh, put out a video guide in the past few days on how to register your projects on the Cabinet Office portal. So I encourage you to have a look at all of those resources in addition to watching this video today. Thank you very much. Uh, that's it for today.